Chapter 3 In the morning, the boy's mother did not cook any pork sausage for breakfast. The ham was on the tin top table, but she did not uncover it. Everybody had biscuits and milk gravy. There was still a faint smell of ham, but the boy missed the scent of sausage coming up to him as soon as, as he stood warming himself. He had hurried out and called Sounder and looked under the house before he had finished buttoning his shirt. But his mother had made him come in. She knew he would be crawling into the cabin. She made him put on his last year's worn-out overalls and ragged jacket of his father's that came down to his knees. It wouldn't keep out much cold, but it was full of because it was full of holes. The boy's mother put what was left of the pork sausage and the ham in a meal sack. When she had wrapped her walnut kernels in brown paper and tied them with a string, she tied a scarf around her head and put on a heavy brown sweater that had pink flannel outing, out, outing patches on the elbows. She put the brown package in a basket. She always carried when she went to the store. She put the meal sack over her shoulder. I'm taking the kernels to the store to sell them, she said to the boys. She did not say where she was going with the meal sack she had swung over her shoulders. Watch the fire, child, she said. Don't go out of hollering distance and leave the young ones. Don't let them out in the cold. Warm some mush in the skillet for you, for y'all to, to eat at dinner time. I'll be home before supper time. Whatever you to do, child, do not leave the children with a roaring fire and go looking for sounders. You ain't going to find them this day. If a stranger comes, don't say nothing. The boy had nodded each time she spoke, but he thought he thought he would say yes or don't worry, I will, but he didn't. He pushed the younger children back out of the cold and closed the door. As his mother stepped off the porch and started for the road, she began to hum softly to herself. It was a song the boy had heard her sing many nights in the cabin. You gotta walk that lonesome valley. You gotta walk it by yourself. Ain't nobody else gonna walk it for you. The boy wanted to run after her. He watched as she became smaller and smaller until the meal sack over her shoulder was just a white speck. And the rest of her became part of the brown road and the gray earth. When the white speck had faded into the earth, the boy looked up at the sky. No sun to thaw things out today, he said aloud to himself. His father always spoke aloud to the wind and the sky, and sometimes to the sun when he stood on the porch in the morning, especially when it rose out of the far lowland cottonwoods and pines like a great ball of fire. Warming the cold bones, his father would say. And preparing for a hunt, his father would caution a full moon hanging over the foothills. Don't shine too bright. You'll make the critters skittish. And Sounder, too, setting on his haunches, would speak to the moon in ghost or in tones of lonesome dog talk. People would be very mean to his mother today, the boy thought. He wondered if she would tell them that the ham had slid across the floor. If she told them, they might just throw it out feed it to their dogs. They might just let his mother keep it and bring it home again. They wouldn't let her keep the pork sausage for it was wrapped in clean white paper and not cooked. They might push and pull his mother and put her in the back of the spring wagon and take her away too. She would spill the walnut kernels and then she wouldn't be able to sell them and buy a sow belly and potatoes. The boy had hoped the sun would shine and it would soften the fro frozen crust of earth and make it easier for him to dig a grave for Sounder. If he found Sounder, if Sounder was dead, he hoped no one would come along and see him carrying a grub hoe and shovel across the field to the big jack oak. They would ask what he was doing, and if anybody passed while he was digging the grave, he would probably hide in the fence row. If they saw him, they might run him off the land. He felt like crying, but he didn't. Crying would only bother him. He would have his hands full of tools or be carrying Sounder's body. His nose would start dripping and be powerful, troublesome, because he wouldn't have a free hand to wipe it. He looked at the armload of wood and punched up the fire. 
Don't open the stove door, he cautioned the younger children. I have to go out some more. He went to his bed and took Sounder's ear from under the pillow. He would bury it with Sounder. He smelled his pillow. It smelled clean and fresh. He put the ear in his pocket so the children wouldn't ask any questions as he passed them on his way on the way out. He smoothed his pillow. He was glad his mother had washed his sheet and pillowcase every week, just like she did for the people who lived in the big houses with curtains on the windows. About twice a year, his mother washed a lot of curtains. The clothesline was filled with them. They were thin, and they were thin, and they were light and ruffly and fluffly. More fun to rub your face against a curtain than on a clean sheet every Monday. The curtains, moving in the breeze, were like sea foam. The boy had never seen sea foam, but his mother had told him that when the Lord calmed the mighty Jordan for the people to cross over, the water moved in little ripples like curtains in a breeze, and soft white foam made ruffles on the top of the water. The boy had never looked out the window that had curtains on it. Whenever he passed houses with curtains on the windows, he remembered that if he put his face close against the curtains, on the wash line, he could see through them. He thought that there were always eyes close against the curtains, having a look at him. He watched the windows out of the corner of his eye. He always felt scared until he passed. Passing a cabin was different. In a cabin window, there were just faces with real eyes looking out. He could just go out now, he thought. The wood in the stove had burned down some, and it would be safe. Besides, he would be close by for a while. Getting the body of Sounder from under the cabin wouldn't be easy. The younger children would bother him. They would ask a lot of questions like, Why is Sounder dead? And will he stay dead? And more than he would not want to answer. When I'm out doing, when I'm out, don't be yelling for me. I'll be through in a while, he said to the smallest, who was looking out of the window. His chin barely high enough to rest on the sill. There's no hurry, the boy thought. All I have, I have all day, and it's still early. And I, he looked out of the window, too. If you're inside, you look out. If you're outside, you look in. But what looks both ways? That's a riddle. What's the answer? He directed to no child in particular, and no one answered. What's the answer? The boy repeated. And then he answered his own riddle. The window is the answer. It looks both ways. None of the children paid any attention. You must go now, said the boy to his brother and sisters. Before it gets colder. The wind is starting up, so keep the door shut. Sounder had not died in his favorite spot right behind the porch steps where he had a hole dug out and where the, father's, the boy's father had put two coffee sacks for a pallet. His mother had said Sounder would crawl to the darkest farthest part of the cabin that's why she made the boy put on his old ragged clothes. The boy could not see all the way under the cabin. At one time, rats had lived there, and they had pushed up the earth in some places so that it almost touched the beams. They did this so they could gnaw through the floor from below. He heard his head and shoulders on nails sticking down from above as he crawled. He heard his knees and elbows on broken glass, rusty sardine cans, and broken pieces of crockery and dishes. The dry dust got in his mouth and tasted like lime and grease. Under the cabin it smelled stale and dead, like old carcasses and snakes. The boy was glad it was winter because in summer there might have been dry land moccasins and copperheads under the cabin. He crawled from the front to the back, looking all along the spaces between the beams. Sounder was not to be seen. The boy would have to go back and forth. Maybe Sounder had pushed with his hind feet and dug a hole into which he had settled. The threadbare knees of last year's overalls opened up, and his bare knees scraped the soil. His father's long jacket caught under his knees as he crawled and jerked his face down into the dust cobwebs drooped over his face and mouth. His mouth was so dry with dust that he could not spit them out. He crawled over every spot under the cabin, but Sounder's body was not there. The boy felt in his pocket. He had lost Sounder's ear under the cabin. It made no difference. It could, could, it could be buried there. 
But where was Sounder's body, he wondered. There's a picture of the boy. Perhaps the injuries in the side of his head and shoulder were only skin wounds. They looked so terrible, maybe they were not bad after all. Perhaps Sounder had, Sounder had limped down the road the way the wagon had taken his master and died. Perhaps he had only been knocked senseless, and that's why he was zigzagging so crazily running for the cabin. No wild creature could have carried the dead body away. Foxes could carry half off dead squirrels and possums, but no animal was big enough to drag Sounder's body away. Maybe the boy, looking under the cabin with a lantern, had caused Sounder to crawl out of the other side and to die in the brown stockland. The boy was crying now. Not that there was any new or sudden sorrow. It just seemed to be nothing else to fill up the vast lostness of the moment. His nose began to run an itch. The tears ran down through the cobwebs and dust that covered his face, making little rivulets. The boy rubbed his eyes with his dirty hands and mixed dust with tears. His eyes began to smart. He followed the road, the way the wagon had taken his father as far as he dared leave the fire and the children in the cabin. Still in holler and distance, there was no sign of Saunders, Sounder's body. He spiraled the brown stock land in ever-widening circles, searching the French, French rows as he went. Under the jacko, oaks, and cottonwoods, there was nothing. In the matted scotch broom tangle, he visualized a great tan body as carefully picked each step, but the dog was not there. <laughs>